I guess we could just get started right off. The, well, first I want to mention, thank you for joining us. Um, it looks like we've got all kinds of people here from all over the world. Um, Sweden, Singapore, India, Greece, Spain, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, and of course, uh, one guy from South Carolina who I think is running an ST30 and a tool room mill. So thank you so much for joining us. If you've got any questions, uh, just generally Haas related uh, comment, put them in the post there, and then we'll uh, start taking some comments also on the different stones, but really anything you'd like. Um, you can see something like this, silicon carbide, you guys know like we use tungsten carbide end mills in our, in our machines, and carbide is just a uh, carbon, right? The carbon's the element mixed with some type of metal. And so what kind of metal is it? So if it's tungsten carbide, then it's tungsten mixed with carbon and we get tungsten carbide. And so silicon carbide is, is a really unique material. It's basically a crystal and it's super, super hard. I mean, right up there with diamonds uh, just about. And because it's a crystal, it's, it's, uh, it's best to be embedded in some other type of wheel. They'll, um, they'll, they'll use different type of resins or um, like a vitrified wheel to hold the silicon carbide, but it's really sharp. It's, it's like brittle sharp. And so it's really good for, uh, uh, for cutting lots of different types of materials. Uh, a lot of people will go with a, like a silicon carbide deburr wheel for everything because it works on just about every material. It's fine on aluminums, Nothing, nothing's great on aluminum, but it's pretty darn good on aluminum if you're light with it, um, the bronze. And it's also got some of the hard stuff as well from the nickel alloys, titaniums, tool steels, this type of stuff. Um, but you don't wanna push too hard on it, it'll break down because it's brittle. And it, the same type of thing is, is working for our sharpening stones as well. And you would mention like knives, that kind of stuff. And so if I've got my pocket knife here and I'm sharpening this, uh, it's a really good way of explaining it. I didn't think about it until you guys were talking about it just before we went live. But if I'm sharpening my, my knife, right? So if I got a knife here and I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll you know, into the blade and sharpen this guy up. If I've been throwing my knife, which I do all the time and it's terrible, I'll take big chunks out of my, my Gerber Easy Outs if I'm tossing them. Um, it's not a good application. But if I've put a nick in this guy, I'm gonna go with a silicon carbide sharpening stone to clean off that nick because it removes material pretty quick and it works just fine even on tool steels like my, like my knife. Um, in fact, this four inch stone that I've got right here, it's got the, the little grooves for my finger. Um, a lot of people call this a knife stone because it protects your fingers because it's meant to be used against a shear or like a blade, right? Either a garden shear or a press of some type and you're cleaning some sharp edge. And so those little grooves along the outside edge protect your fingers from those, from those sharp edges. And so silicon carbide's great, but it's not gonna give you a perfectly fine finish. If I was sharpening a knife, and, and the same's gonna apply to what these materials are good for on our machines or anything. If I'm sharpening a knife, I'll go with a silicon carbide stone to rough things out. And then I'm gonna move myself over to an aluminum oxide stone. Now, a, a lot of us grew up and we called these things India stones because India stone is, it's funny, I grabbed this from my toolbox, is a trademark of Norton for this guy. And so that's like a brand name. Um, Norton might call a silicon carbide a crystalline stone. They might call a uh, aluminum oxide an India stone. And India stones are, are man-made aluminum oxide, but they're generally speaking um, smoother, finer. The chunks of aluminum oxide in there are bigger and less sharp than silicon carbide. And so I'm gonna get a finer finish on a pocket knife if I'm finishing with this guy. And if I wanted to go one step further, we actually have, I don't know what you're using in the rest of the world, but, but here in the US, we're using something called an Arkansas stone. And Arkansas stones are different. They're super, super, super duper fine. And they're almost, almost polishing. And so they're some of the best stones in the world. And this is not, um, it's not man-made. They cut these things out of the ground, they polish them, and then they send them out. So this looks a bit like marble. So if I was polishing my knife right now, I would go from silicon carbide, if it had a nick. Otherwise, I'd go right with, a, with an aluminum oxide stone. They've got a medium and a, and a fine finish on this guy. And then I would move over to an Arkansas stone for that final scalpel uh, finish on it. And so, so for the machine, for when you're doing your machine table, for example, yeah, yeah. and you did a whole video about this uh, quite a while oh, ago. Yeah. I think it's part of the vice, the vice mounting video. Um, but you're gonna, first of all, you're kind of going over the table to figure out if you have any high spots. 
and then you're going to worry about whether you, how you're going to knock those down. You were saying that's usually a two-step uh, uh, so, two-step approach. So, like this is a 433. This is a um, this is a aluminum oxide stone. It's what we carry in the shop at the Haas factory. And if somebody needs a a bench stone, and again, I'm a machinist, so I would call this a bench stone. If if I was a, um, a woodsman and I was sharpening my axe, I might call it a whetstone. And um, and so I would take this uh, stone and I'm going to run it across the table. Uh, normally not in the same pattern every time, get some, get some different motion going. And I'm gonna just use this as an inspection tool to check and see if there's any high spots in my table or my fixture, my tooling. And uh, again, uh, this is an aluminum oxide stone. It's got that nice kind of rust red color to it. And then I used to use, this one's terrible. It's just an awful looking stone. It's got a lot of years on it. Um, and if I look through the black gunk on this guy, I can actually see some of the red sticking through. So for years, I used an aluminum oxide stone. It was great, and I used it to check for high spots. Now, if I did have a high spot on my, on my cast iron table, and I tried to use my aluminum oxide stone to take that off, if somebody dropped a vise on it and it left a high spot, um, if you use an aluminum oxide stone, it's gonna take the high spot off, but you're gonna trash your stone. It's gonna put some gouges in it. It's gonna take some time. I would normally move over to a silicon carbide stone and it's got a medium and a, a fine finish on it. And I would start with the medium lightly, go to the fine, and then I would work my way down to an India stone to, to clean that guy up. Um, and, and that's kind of a good way of looking at it. The silicone carbides are sharp, they're fast cutting, and you kind of take things lightly with them um, and they'll do what you need to. But I wouldn't want to try and take down material with, uh, with never with an Arkansas stone. It's too hard, it's, it's gonna it's almost polish it. Um, a fine India stone is not really going to remove a whole lot of material quickly. Uh, that's why it's so good for knives. Um, your blades will last longer, right? If you, if you sharpen with a silicon carbide, you'll get a nice edge, but it's not going to last very long. And it's also going to turn your, your, your knife into a toothpick knife pretty, pretty fast. It's going to cut the blade down. And, and I'll mention this now because we were talking about different uses for it. So you've got the woodsman who might use one of these stones. If I was in the woods, really like in the woods, I might... Um, I might get this thing wet with water because these things are porous. They've got like little bumps and holes in them. And if I'm scraping a table with it or if I'm uh, sharpening a knife with it, those pores in the material in the stone are going to fill with something and it's going to be the swarf of whatever metal I'm trying to sharpen. And so if you fill it with water, the water is going to act like a lubricant and it's going to keep the swarf out of the stone. Um, but one problem with, with a lot of these stones, a lot of these um, aluminum oxide stones, they're come, they come pre-oiled. And so while you can get aluminum oxide stones that aren't oiled, this one's, I don't think it's oiled. If it's not oiled, you can start off with water and use it as a lubricant if you're sharpening a knife and just use a whetstone. It's nice and easy, put it away. And if you're uh, out in the woods, you're, they're gonna, there's gonna be a river there, right? And so you're gonna clean off your, your stones that way. But in a machine shop, we use oil for everything and you can't avoid oil. And once like these Norton stones, they come pre-oiled. Once a stone's got oil in it, it's gonna have oil in it forever. It's gonna displace the water. You can't use it as a wet stone ever again. For water, it's gonna be an oil stone. And so there's some differences there, but this whole- I have to admit that like in my case, yeah. not being uh, you know, uh, a machinist all the time and kind of doing a lot of different stuff, but having to use stones for different, you know, yeah. different surfacing stuff, usually it was whatever was closest at hand. If it was a, if it was a bottle of oil, if it was WD-40, it was whatever totally. I could use. Because yeah, you are trying to wet it to keep it from loading up. Um, and some things work better than others. Yeah, and the oil and the coolant is already kind of oil. We'll have an right. emulsion, which is, which is basically oil in, the, in our coolant. And so if you're using it to clean your table, it's an oil stone, right? So you're gonna use it with oil 100% uh, of the time. And these, these other wheels we're using for the deburr, they're, they're similar but different. Even the grinding wheel on like a bench grinder, um, it's gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be either aluminum oxide or silicon carbide for the most part. I mean, there's some other stuff out there, zir zirconium, you know, alumina, that kind of stuff. There's some, some ceramic wheels. Um, if I'm grinding a carbide tool by hand, uh, again, so this stuff's so stinking hard, the silicon carbide, it'll grind glass. It'll grind right through carbide, um, you know, if, if you need it to. So the green wheels on the bench grinders at the shop, uh, you don't want to use those for steel. So generally speaking, right, for normal, regular, mild steels, you don't want to use silicon carbide. They're fine. They're fine. These, these deburr, deburr, wheels are, deburr wheels are fine on steels, 
but like the bench grinders, uh, my, my aluminum oxide is kind of my first choice for, for regular ferrous materials. Um, but like the green wheel, the green silicon carbide wheels at the, at the, at the shop, um, you're going to get yelled at if you try to sharpen some high speed steel tool on there because it's going to, the silicon carbide's hard, but it's also brittle and you're going to start deforming that wheel. You're going to, you're going to put lines in it. You're going to ruin the wheel awfully fast and it's not going to be good for grinding carbide anymore. And if you're actually grinding like end mills for like real, not just putting a flat on them, you'll end up moving over to a, um, a diamond wheel, which is even harder. So I'm going to just throw a couple of these comments in here. Super, Super AWAC says, after Arkansas stones, you have ruby stones for the finest work. I've never used a ruby stone. That's like, that must it. be like, there was a scene in uh, uh, Kung Fu Panda where he just looks at the sword and it'll cut you. So I imagine that if you get to that level, it's going to be very, 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 very sharp. And we'll use diamond paste and that kind of stuff as well uh, with a lapping, um, a lapping board. So we'll have a, a yeah, lapping, lapping board. Yeah, lapping is just a whole nother, a whole completely different thing. It just keeps getting finer and finer and finer. And finer. finer. But again, for the machine, if, if I'm using a bench stone, I'm going to use an aluminum oxide stone. And if you don't know, if just looking at it, generally speaking, a silicon carbide is going to be some type of gray material, generally speaking. Now, this is aluminum oxide. It's gray. But generally speaking, if it's a stone, uh, it's going to be gray. And the darker the stone, the rougher it is. But... So this is um, silicon carbide, it's gray. And I wonder why, so like my mom is an artist, Doreen Terryberry, you can go Doreen Terryberry online and look for her oil paintings. But she would always do her base paintings, uh, the outline of stuff on her paintings in an Indian red, Indian red. And so uh, I remember growing up, uh, Indian red is like a, a pretty common pigment in India. And so they would use it to mix paints back with the masters. And so it was kind of a, maybe it was the rust in the soil, the aluminum, uh, not aluminum, but it would be iron oxide. Mm -hmm, iron oxide. And so I have no idea why this is red, but if I looked at this, I would call this Indian red. Uh, this I would call this Indian red. And so maybe that's where it first got its name is from the pigment in the ground in India. But I'm, the only reason I'm saying that is because um, if I say that out loud, Indian red, uh, now it's gonna be stuck in your heads. And now the next time you see a stone like this, or like this little guy right here, you're gonna think orange or Indian red, and you're gonna think, oh, that's an aluminum oxide stone. That's good for just about everything, but it's not great for aluminum. Uh, the pores are pretty big. It's gonna clog up super fast. And um, especially on a, on a grinding wheel, like a grinding grinding wheel, if that sucker starts loading up with aluminum, then it's gonna rub. And if it rubs, it's gonna get hot, which is gonna melt the aluminum more, which is gonna clog it more. And you're, gonna, you're not gonna be removing material it's not gonna be sharp enough to remove the aluminum. It's just gonna be heating up and that bad things happen when you do that. So these wheels, these uh, Deber wheels are much, much better for that. They're, these wheels are called um, Convolute, which is a, uh, it's kind of a weird name, convoluted name. Uh, convolute <laughs> is kind of like a conch shell or it's like the petals on a flower. It just mean that's, a, that's layered. And uh, I, I remember I had a guy come up to me at the shop and he was like, hey, I just destroyed the wheel. Uh, what do you mean? And so I went down there and it was pretty cool. Um, he had shown me the wheel and it was like a little flap. It was coming undone. And so just for fun, you know, this is a hundred dollar wheel. We grabbed a pair of pliers, started pulling on it and it unwrapped it, right? Just like an abrasive pad that had been wound around an, a coil. And that's exactly what these things are. Um, to, to have it break down to, sh to expose a new abrasive, it's got this tightly wound uh, material, abrasive material with either the silicon carbide or the aluminum oxide. And um, that's why these things have a direction. So there's a yellow arrow on them. And that's why you don't want, yeah, you don't really want to mount them going in the wrong yeah, direction because you're going to potentially yeah. unwrap them. You could, it could, I mean, as they, it were. It's yeah. probably not going to come flying off in a big, in a big band. But. I've seen it twice and maybe it was the parts we were working on. They're really sharp um, and so, you know, straight parts. And so mounting it backwards caused them to unravel, plus they got hot. And so I know it can happen, um, although it's not you know, likely, but it also might leave a little bump as this flap comes round and round and round. So normally you wanna mount these things with the, with the yellow arrow uh, going in the same direction as, as the wheel. Uh, so it wears evenly, uh, just like it's supposed to. And so that's, that's kind of a cool little thing about these things, but it's good to know that these wheels, these um, convolute um, deburring wheels have a direction. So the, the flap gets you know, pushed. And, and, the grinders always have an arrow on, excuse me, always have an arrow on them. And normally they're always spinning towards you, right? So you're walking into them, they're always pushing the part down. No grinder is going to run backwards where it's going to throw the part up into your face. It's going to push it down towards the ground. So you'll want these, you know, the arrow facing, you know, over the top, 
facing down all the time. And, and normally the bench grinders have a, a left and a right hand thread, so they're kind of self-tightening. So you don't have to tighten them too much because they, they hold themselves on. So we have a question here, which I think uh, is there's a short answer for it, but then that leads us onto an in, another interesting question that was on uh, your deeper video. Uh, Rahul uh, Kaviapati asks, do you guys sell any wheels for die grinders or Dremel tools? And it, at this point, the answer is no. And I the don't know that we would, who knows? We're, we're always so, adding stuff, yes, but. Hostooling.com is adding stuff. So we're adding the stuff that a machinist would use kind of first. And I'm, I'm really happy with these wheels. And so if anyone that's been in a job shop has used these wheels, uh, wheels like them. And so that's why we started out with these. And the grades that we chose for these are just the most common grades. So for a, a general wheel that'll cut anything, you got the silicon carbide uh, in like an, an 8S or, you know, type, um, it's, how, it's how tight they wind these things. And so that's gonna kind of tell you what the life is and how hard you need to push. And so, um, we're starting off with these because um, they're, they're common and kind of used more in a CNC shop. I imagine that someday we might expand to, to other stones as well. But again, you see the same type of thing, silicon carbide and aluminum oxide in all kinds of different wheels. And uh, generally speaking, the aluminum oxide, not great for grinding on aluminum, although nothing's great on aluminum. Um, and the silicon carbide, though it's so sharp, if you take it light, it's gonna take nice small bites out of the aluminum and it's gonna come right off. And, but the silicon carbide's also really, really good for hard stuff, which is, it makes it hard to explain um, because it's, this is a good, the aluminum oxide wheel is great you know, general purpose. You can push on them hard, they're gonna last a long time. As we were saying, it, like this usage chart here, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit like inserts. You know, there's a lot of things can be usable, useful in different, <laughs> in similar applications. Um, but there, there are a few places where you really don't want to use certain things on certain materials, but... And there's always there's an exception to the rules. Overlap. It's so hard to talk about this stuff. So the chart that they put together I thought was fantastic, and, and, it's, and it's absolutely wrong, because there's no way to answer this question in a total blanket statement that's going to work for everything. But I like the way the chart was made, less aggressive, more aggressive. Um, and, and there's some interpretation that needs to be made. Um, but generally speaking, you use this one for, you know, non-ferrous materials. These things will cut glass. These things will cut glass. They're so sharp um, as well. And, um, you know, plastics, wood, whatever. And so um, they're worth checking out. Also, if I'm trying to go for like a nice fine finish, like on a golf putter or some type of little widget part that I, I use, sometimes a nice um, silicon carbide wheel will leave a finer kind of line grain finish. In fact, we'll take, a, we'll take chunks of aluminum and we'll put a pocket into them and we'll mill a pocket into that from the, sh the shape of my part, especially if it's a flat part. And then I'll drop that into the, the pocket, into the block of aluminum that I've got, and you'll roll it against the wheel and you'll end up with this beautiful line grain finish on your parts, which is kind of cool and it's super fast, doesn't take any effort at all. And, and you can try these different wheels to get just the kind of finish that you want. It's kind of like one of those big time saver machines. Um, I don't know if you've, you've had them before or seen them. They've got a brace of wheels in there and you'll adjust it up and down, usually for sheet metal parts, and it'll line grain uh, materials. And so uh, you can line grain your own little parts uh, just by creating a little block of aluminum with a pocket, drop your part in, and, and you can line grain it with these guys because uh, they're so easy to control uh, with how hard you're, you're pushing or not pushing. We were talking about live tools on lathes. There was a question that came in over the comments, over the chats, and somebody was asking, can they run this wheel in my ST, my ST30 with live tooling? And my, my short answer is no. You don't want to for a few different reasons. Uh, not that it's not possible, um, but you don't want a lot of abrasives inside your machine. It's just gonna sit there and grind. It's gonna go through the coolant system, uh, and it's just gonna continue to wear on things. So it's, these aren't grinding machines necessarily, um, but you, you could, you can always do that. Um, plus our live tooling, it maxes out at 6,000 RPMs, which is fine for this wheel. But for a smaller wheel, you'd want more like, you know, 10,000 or something. But it's really about the, um, you know, the, that kind of abrasive material hanging out in your machine that we wouldn't like. And besides that, these wheels are ablative. They, they break down. And that's every time you hit this thing, it breaks down a little bit, exposes more abrasive, and it starts chewing on the, the material uh, some more. And so that means the wheel is going to get smaller and smaller as you go. And normally on a dedicated grinding machine, um, they're, going to, they're going to have dressing in there. So it's going to come in, it's going to redress the wheel. And if you've got a, a regular, you know, 
um, regular grinder, surface grinder, uh, you'll have like a um, you'll have a little diamond in there, like a real like one carat diamond on the end of some tool steel that you'll come across and redress the wheel to make it flat again. And then you might have a probe that comes in and, and measures the, the diameter of that wheel as things go. So there's machines that are made specifically for that. Generally speaking, if I was going to do any type of deburr work, deburr work like that inside of a, of a Haas lather mill, uh, I would go with a brush probably. So there's brushes. Um, again, uh, it's a brand, but Osborne brushes is what I call them because Osborne's a brand and they make brushes with abrasives built into them. And you can take those guys and they're great for castings uh, that have irregular shapes. And so you can't use a chamfer tool because it's just a, such a weird shape. Um, but you can take that brush, you can touch it off, then bring it down by a millimeter. And then it'll, it'll have some roughness to there. It'll run across the surface of a part and take out those edges. Really good for like when you have lots of channels and it's just too much to deburr. You can hit all those surfaces in one shot. You can even reverse the spindle and hit it the other way so you're not rolling the burr you know, one way and, and then leaving it there. So um, brushes are fantastic. You can write macros that brings the, the brush down by a, you know, a half millimeter every so many parts. Um, so there's good ways to deburr inside the machine. Um, in fact, some of those are maybe more, is it more applicable to mills or are you gonna sometimes still use that same kind of thing on a lathe? You're almost always gonna use those on mills. There's very few times on a lathe when you need to use a brush. Uh, Cross drilled holes are one of those times when you might want to run through there with something, but they do make, you know, um, they do make different hones and brushes that can come in there and deburr, different deburr tools. Generally speaking with a lathe, almost every, every turned dimension can be hit with a boring bar or an OD tool. So there's no reason to have a, uh, a burr on a turned part. Um, if you spend enough time programming, you'll be able to get every burr off that part, unless you've got some, some live tooling, some milling going on or some, uh, you know, cross drilling, then we might run into problems, um, you know, that type of thing. And we were just talking about this too. Uh, if you've got burrs on your threads, uh, this just came up. We sent out an email last week or a couple weeks ago uh, with inserts for threading. And if you've got burrs on your threads, it's a nasty material and you're rolling the burr one way or another, a lot of guys will come in and they'll turn the OD of their threads again, and then they'll come and they'll hit their threads a second last time to kind of give it a spring pass to knock any burrs off. And that just wastes a lot of time. Uh, and I've done it a million times. You're going to hit something twice to, to get rid of the burr. But you can buy topping inserts, full profile inserts that have the, the top, bottom sides of the, of the thread profile all in one insert. And so there just isn't a chance for burrs on those threads because it's, it's done with the same tool as opposed to an OD tool and a threading tool. So there's lots of different ways to deburr parts on the lathe. Uh, this, this, is, this is not my first, second, or third choice. Cool. Thanks to uh, those of you that have uh, come back to this uh, new stream. Uh, we got uh, Bill from New York, um, Frank from Connecticut. I'm sorry I can't say your name from the Ukraine. Uh, I have no <laughs> idea how to pronounce that, but thanks for, for getting back on the stream with us. So changing gears a little bit, uh, Harindu Gamlath asks, glad you're back. Can an SD10Y do rigid tapping with live tooling on the sub spindle? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So it's gonna, you're going to hold the, the spindle there. It doesn't have a huge break. On the sub-spindle, it's basically a finishing spindle. Uh, and so there's not a lot of um, uh, power there for the braking. We'd have to look it up. The products guys, Milton, could tell us what the, what, the, what the braking torque is, how much it'll hold. If you're on center, though, absolutely no problem whatsoever. You're going to come with the live tooling, just like you would on the main spindle, and you can come in and, and drill and tap just fine because it's all, that's all timed with, the, with the, um, the live tooling, the synchronization, and not the sub-spindle uh, for that. So, yeah, absolutely. We've got more, more people joining us. Turkey, Illinois. Thank you, folks. Um, Vision Forge asks, when are you guys going to start selling BT30 tooling for the drill, for the drill tap machines? And uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I don't know, because we, we were looking at that. I know they were testing a lot of different things. We have so many tools. They've expanded the tooling department for HaasTooling.com by, you know, just, just, they keep expanding. And so they're testing all different types of tools, but that's, that's uh, I don't know. Yeah. I know the, they were looking at it, but no, I don't know. No clear time frame on that. And actually that leads into, uh, we had several questions um, on the last I can't find them now. Anyway, but several questions about when hosteling was going to be released, both in Europe and then all around the world. We had a question about India and from Qatar, I think. And um, the plan is to have 
Haas tooling released in Europe by the end of this year. And actually nice. during the Emo show in October, we're gonna be, we have a, a, big, a big Haas tooling um, presentation space uh, at that show. So that's the, it is very, it is, the, the reason it's taken this amount of time is it's quite difficult. There's so much involved. It's not what you think. We have the support for it also, but even just expanding throughout the United States, there's different tax laws in each and every state. And so it's more of an accounting issue than anything else. And so they're getting that all figured out. And, uh, and then you run into that as you, as you go into each, each new country. Once you cross international borders, it just becomes more and more of that kind of those, those tax boundaries and it's all getting taken care of. So eventually it'll, it'll just keep growing in that, in that, in that way. Um, let's see. So I had another interesting question from last time. Uh, Frank Van Niekirk asks, will B-axis tilt probing be available on the UMCs in the future? Setting the datum in a tilted coordinate system. You were saying, we were talking about this so a little bit earlier, and you were saying that this... There's all kinds of crazy cool stuff coming with the probe. Uh, it's, a little, it's a little vague on the UMC. So, the, so we've got... We've got um, kind of like tilted work planes. So on our, uh, I'm looking around here, looking for the right machine. So we have tilted head machines, like our GM25 axis. And, um, and we've got uh, these Milturn machines that we're coming out with, right? We've got our VMT750. And those are tilting head machines. And so the only way you're gonna be able to do something at that funny angle is by having these tilted work planes. And so we've got that with our G268. And it is crazy simple on a Haas. You simply say, okay, go to B30 degrees. You call up your G268, and that's it. You've just called up the plane. You can define it with an IJK, okay. which is a very specific angle around X, Y, and Z, but why? You just move the head to where you want it with this angle, and if it's a five axis, you move it this angle, and then you call up your, your G268, and things just work. So, so that's there right now. Now, as far as the, the probing on like funny angles like that, they're doing a lot to make that work right now. It's been in testing for some time. Um, and there's all kinds of little things that are being developed in the software that, that you might not notice that, are, that, are, that have to be done be, before they have that, that type of probing capability. One of them is um, if you've got a brand new machine, if you have the latest software on there, you're going to notice that if I call up tool 1 into my spindle, tool 10 into my spindle, and I jog it down on top of my part, then the tip of my tool is going to be like, wait a second, normally it's some random number. It's a machine position. Today, with the latest software, if you jog that thing down, the tip of the tool, it's going to say Z0, because if that's my G54 Z0, it's going to automatically take into account a tool offset number that matches the spindle, the, the tool in the spindle at that moment. And you're thinking, why was that done? And a little secret, one of the reasons it was done was for the five axis probing and other things like that. So we can activate a probe and have it working all the time. So you can just jog up to something and have it probe, and it'll automatically calculate the angle of the head when it's coming in. So all of these pieces in the software are coming together to, to give us uh, more powerful probing, especially with five axis parts. We're gonna have all the kind of information we want, but there are certain things we need to get done first. And what's cool about that, when it takes into account the, the tool length offset, when you're just jogging around, is that you've got this immediate DRO system, a digital readout, like you would on your manual mill and lathe. So when you come and just start handle cranking, if you've got the E-wheels on a TL, it's gonna be where you can just call up your tool in the turret, jog up to the face of the part, set your work offset if it's already done, and, and everything's just gonna match, just like a DRO on a manual machine without having to call up um, your, your tool and work offsets. Same thing on the mills, you bring a tool into the spindle and it's gonna automatically call up your, your, your tool offset um, automatically. So all this has, is coming together. Uh, we've been using it at the shop for a long time, but it's going through testing. So we'll see more and more of that. Yeah. Cool. Well, we have another question. This is pretty similar, I think, really. Um, Krager asked, will the Haas 5-axis machine support vector programming instead of rotary? And that's kind of all in that same, it's kind of the same thing. game so plan, right? It's a weird kind of thing. So it depends on which kind of machine. Honestly, you, we've, got, we've got tool center point control for full simultaneous 5-axis. We've got dynamic um, work offsets, G254, on a machine like this, this 5-axis machine. But again, on this type of machine, you don't need those type of working planes, those type of vector programming, because the head of the spindle is always facing along the Z axis. It's never off you know, angle from the Z axis. So you tilt this thing to B30, whatever, and it's always gonna work. You call up your, your G254 and it's just gonna work. So on this type of machine, you don't really need that. Um, and we've already got tool center point control. We've already got dynamic work offsets. On a tilted head machine, 
like we were saying before, you need something else because everything gets wonky at those angles. And that's where we've given you those tilted work planes with the G268. And so it's, um, it's a very specific way of programming that, but, but we've got all those bases covered right now, depending on the machine that you've got. So we, we're feeling pretty confident that what we have right now can machine any part you need, whether it's on a mill like a UMC, uh, or whether it's a tilted head, you know, like a knuckle machine, uh, a head head machine. Very good. Okay, so we have, uh, switching back to Haas tooling, we have several questions about metric tools. Um, Harindu, Same Gamlath, thing. and Rempat 1994. Will Haas tooling be in metric? I took a look at it, we can only find Imperial. And the answer is yes, we are working that, uh, on that. I don't have a, a firm time frame for when that's gonna happen, but it's, it, that is in process right now. And obviously if we're uh, gonna be selling tools in Europe <laughs> shortly, we better yeah. have some yeah. metric tooling to sell or we're not gonna be doing, to selling very many, t very many tools. Yeah, exactly. So the answer is yes, very much in the, in the process of working on that. Um, then other, another big one from, uh, from the last session, uh, where we were, t we had just released the video with the, the review of the TM zero with Brian and Bob talking about it. So there are a lot of questions about when that was, when the TM zero was going to be released. And we were talking about that point about probably October, maybe right now, the, uh, the plan is to release the TM zero, uh, on the 1st of July, and that will with a plans to start shipping that, I think around October is what I had written down here. Yes, September, September October time frame for shipping those machines. Um, so for all of those, all of you that are waiting patiently for the or not or impatiently for the TM zero, that's the time frame we're looking at. And the new other the other TM models updates are going to follow that probably right behind that the release of the TM zero. Um, all right, that's enough about the TMs. <laughs> <laughs> kind of just came to an end there. Let's see. Um, we, this is one I'll answer uh, myself. Uh, John Harris asked, do you know when you will be hiring for the Henderson cam campus? Oh, what a great <laughs> question. Yeah, I live in Vegas and I'm so excited to see you guys there. So we are certainly not ready to hi start hiring there yet. Right now we're still working on the groundwork and uh, putting in uh, you know, utilities and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's quite, a, quite a large piece of land that we've got over there right now, from what I hear, the plans are for the building to be in the realm of 2 million square feet under roof, which is double what we have right now here in Oxnard. Um, so it's definitely gonna be a big building or buildings, but no plans yet to start hiring. Yeah, yeah. That'll be at Expanded least a year. Opportunities. Yeah, we're probably, I think the plan is to about t early 2022 to start the building. That's the current plan anyway. As an expansion, sure, different product lines. So let's see. Um, interesting. Joshua Ward asks, do you have gang tooling for SL lays? I wanted to center drill, center drill, drill and tap on one tool instead of tur turning. I know. We, so there's a there's a plenty of things that can be done with gang tooling. I've seen some really cool gang tools online um, for a bunch of different machines that people are making, and um, we do not sell gang tooling right now for the for the SLs or the STs. Uh, currently. So there's some aftermarket people. We can look online and see what's out there. You can also make your own um, to some extent, and it's a it's a really useful and powerful tool. Um, something that they're looking at constantly. I know the products guys. Um, are getting that question uh, a lot, um, you know, looking at more gang tooling, because you can really take advantage of it. So we've got twin boring bar holders and this kind of thing, which will hold two tools, uh, but not true gang tooling. Um, like you'd see, like even our CL though, our live tooling has, has gang tooling built in for those, for those couple tools. Uh, but we don't sell gang tooling holders, but uh, there sure are a whole lot of aftermarket people out there that are, that are providing stuff like that, but it would just require a web search. Uh, this is also another question from last last month's uh, live event. Vision Forge asked, "Will the TM zero P work with pallet changers or robots?" <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. Yes, if you're willing to do a little bit of work, probably is the answer. Maybe. Yeah, anything's possible, but it, you're on your own for that. So we've sold in the past. We had robot ready interface and this type of thing. And what defined those machines was was first and foremost an auto door. Does the machine have an auto door? If it's got an auto door, everything after that becomes simple. If it doesn't have an auto door, then there's no there's no safe way to open and close things. Now we've got universal robots, cobots, that type of thing. 
um, which can open and close the door, physically grab the door and open it and close it uh, without a cage. We're running systems like that all over the place. Uh, we've got um, regular robots, which are in, in, case, in, in cages, safety cages, which can open and close a door. Beyond that, if your machine doesn't have an auto door, um, there's all kinds of cell safe signals and heartbeats that we're waiting for from the machine um, to make sure that it's a safe environment. And all those are kind of tied in with the auto door option, which is why we don't support automation if you don't have the auto door. So, so we don't do it. If you don't have an auto door, you're not going to run automation with us necessarily, unless it's some type of cobot situation or you've built your own cell. But believe me, your, your HFOs, a lot of the HFOs out there have gotten really good at that automation. They'll provide you know, turnkey systems for you uh, along those lines. And you can always create your own M code relays that, that open and close things in the back of the machine. But once you've crossed that line and you're playing with uh, you know, door interlocks and that kind of stuff, it's, 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 it's your machine, it's on you. Uh, we only work with complete systems and that starts with auto doors. Right, right. Um, another question from last time, Quattro asks, is there a way that I can probe more than one hole in a part and see both values in the macros? Sure. And the trick, there's like a little bit there's, of, basically a little bit of a yeah, trick to it, right? Yeah, so, so there's, there's this, I don't remember the code. So if you go to the Haas website and you go to HaasCNC.com, you can search down there on the top thing for the Renishaw Inspe Inspection Plus, I'm sorry, Renishaw Inspection Plus manual, and then you get all this information in there. So one way to, to find out you know, the angle between two hole locations is to use this P9834, or is it 9843, that, that cycle where it'll probe one thing, it'll remember it, probe another thing, it'll do some math calculation in between, and, and it'll, it'll, it'll give you the angle between two holes or, or different stuff like that. Generally speaking though, once you've gone down that road, you're gonna write your own macro. So our XYZ is stored in like, macro variable pound 187, 188, 189. And you can see that in the inspection plus manual. And if you're on next gen control, that'll be macro variable 10,000, 188, 10,189 right in there, that range. And so if I was probing a bore, I might probe a bore and then say, okay, uh, macro variable 101, pound 101 equals pound 188. And then I'm gonna store that probed information into macro variable 101. So my first hole, that information is now gonna be in 101. Then I go to a second hole, I probe it again, and then as soon as I'm done with that cycle, blocking look ahead, we made videos on that, you can Google them, we'll say pound 102 equals pound 188. So we're gonna store that probe information from that second probe hole into variable 102. So, so after each probing cycle, we take our probed information and then we store it someplace more permanent. Um, because the probing routines wipe out all those variables and they overwrite them with each and every probe hit. And so um, after each probe, you have to write it someplace, put it someplace, in another more permanent macro variable so you can do your own calculations with it. So that's the easiest way is just to take care of it yourself. Maybe we, uh, looks like we're getting close to the, the our end time. Um, maybe we wrap this up with one more question about grinding. This is an interesting one. I'm not exactly sure what, uh, anyway, the question from Intubun Gamer is, is it possible to do grinding on a UMC or maybe even machine gr carbide with special end mills? Not exactly sure what this application is, but. Yeah, so, so again, it's that same type of thing. You gotta be really careful. We've got people, oh my goodness. We've got some terrible, awful, horrible, horrible photographs of machines where people will buy machines and use them how we, do, how we say not to use them. They run these machines with water for, for coolant uh, for their grinding operations. So there's, there's no oil in there. There's nothing to, to lubricate the way covers and this kind of stuff. And so they're running these things with water and they're running grinding on it. And they'll buy these machines, they'll run it on glass. Uh, silicone carbide's great for any hard material, even, even grinding on glass. And so they'll be grinding on glass and carbide and weird stuff all the time. And they have to buy special bellows to protect their, their ball screws. And uh, it's just really, it's really, really hard on the machines. And we have a lot of customers that do that and they get good at it, and they get good at their own maintenance. But that is totally um, It's the same as the robot base. on the TM0, yeah. right? It's Those very type much. of abrasives are horrible for CNC machines, just awful. So yeah, absolutely don't do it. But at the same time, we got lots of people who, who are doing that all the time and making it work, but they've made it work, and they've got incredible maintenance schedules to, to, to keep things going 
or they just replace the machine every so often, every five, six years um, for their application. So that's one way to do it. So no, you don't want to be grinding inside the machine. Um, it, generally unless, speaking, you, unless you've made preparations Unless for you do, it. and there's people that do that kind of grinding all the time. And then, then it's, it's, it's a great use of the machine. They're used to the machine. It's, um, it's a great value for them. Well, maybe let's let's wrap it up. Is there anything more you'd like to say about the about the grinding par paraphernalia you have on your deep brewing oh, paraphernalia? So, so you know what's funny? So I'm looking here at my old wheels, and they're all chewed up. You know what I'd like from you guys, if you could, leave a comment. Let me know how you're cleaning your 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 stones, your bench stones. Um, how are you cleaning these things? So I'm not I'm not an expert on grinding. I love CNC mills. I love CNC lathes, and I use. Um, stones, grinders, this type of thing, as, as much as I need to in my CNC work, but I'm not a grinder. When I walk to the Haas factory and I see our, our gear hobs and our grinding um, area, I'm blown away. It's a, it's a very unique beast. Um, and so I'm not as confident as I am on these machines as I am with, let's say, grinding wheels. All these I, I used every day. Um, and these guys I use every day, but actual grinding wheels, not my thing. But Cleaning these things off, there's all kinds of, of weird homebrew methods to clean these. You can buy um, flattening stones, which are kind of like stones. They're just aluminum oxide or silicon carbide stones with grooves in them. They look like lapping plates. And you can run your stones across them, and they'll clean them out with the debris. And those are a good way. Uh, what I used to do is I'd go by the grinding room and where they're actually doing quite a bit of grinding, and I would grab a handful of the grinding dust from those wheels. And we had a, uh, an old cast iron table that we used for different things. And I would put that, that dust, all that abrasive dust on the table, grab my wheel, we would run it over the iron, and I would clean my stones that way. Some people dip them in kerosene, all kinds it's of like crazy reverse things. reverse lapping or something. Yeah, you can take something. two stones and rub them together and clean them up. And so there's, it is, it's like reverse lapping. Yeah, you're it's using like you said, like when you, you use accidentally or whatever, use aluminum on a, on a, on a heavy grinding ah, wheel and you it load it up it completely. Up. Oh then, my you're, gosh. then you're searching for something else you're to like guy. unload it, like another chunk of steel or something. I, and oh, who knows if that's the right way. Yeah, so what are you gonna do? You can find another chunk of wheel. You guys, you have those, those big, the rough coarse um, grinding wheels, the bench grinding wheels. So if you ever seen those star, uh, the, the star, um, what do they call it? Dressers, they're wheel dressers. And so you load that sucker up and then you pull out that star wheel. It's got all the little teeth on it. It looks like a, right. like a pastry tool. <laughs> and you walk up to the grinder and you go, and, and it gets rid of all that aluminum that the last guy put in there. And you have to clean off the grinding wheel because so-and-so you know, loaded up with aluminum. It was me that loaded it up. <laughs> yeah. Those things are terrible. Those star wheel dressers are just horrible. They're fine for fabrication work where you're just roughing out some material. But now that you're never going to sharpen a drill bit by hand on that, on that wheel again. Uh, because those star uh, wheel dressers are so rough. Um, you can buy diamond wheel dressers that look like tiny like little hammers, but they've got diamond material on them. You can square up your wheels with those and redress the wheels there. Um, so there's all different kinds of wheel dressers out there that, that, are, um, that are pretty efficient. But uh, yeah, anyhow, so that's, that's, if you have anything at all, any secret tricks in your bag of how to clean off your stones, uh, let us know, put it in the comments. And again, if you've got a, a great source for gang live tooling for your lays, uh, SLST, what have yeah, you. Yeah, drop it in the comments drop by all means. Drop it in the comments, please. we'd love to see it. And if there's something we haven't answered in the, in the, uh, the questions and comments here, by all means, that we'll post this video and the original one as well up on YouTube and uh, you can ask those questions there and we'll, oh, we'll yeah. try to get around to answering them. And I'll say it again. So if you guys aren't sure which, which tools to buy, if you're not sure what you're gonna buy, so generally speaking, if you're going to buy these guys, um, these Deber wheels, if yeah, it was what's me... what's the best one to start with? Honestly, I'm going to buy an aluminum oxide wheel. Um, this aluminum oxide, aluminum oxide, it's uh, hardness 8. It's a medium grade. This is kind of rough. I'm going to buy uh, silicon carbide. Uh, I'm going to probably buy the, um, the 8 as well. This is a, this is a, a softer one. Um, you can always go a little bit ha harder with it, but if you're gonna go with hard materials, that's it. So you could, I would get one of each of those two and you'll test it on different materials and hardnesses. You'll see the difference. You'll see how quick or, or not quick they wear out on your particular parts. And so if you're doing any type of production, you need to do that because you're gonna see a difference. Can you get away with an aluminum oxide general wheel? Do you have to go with the silicon carbide for that sharpness and clean cutting? Uh, on your machines, generally speaking, uh, some type of aluminum oxide stone, bench stone for cleaning your tables. It's what everyone else uses. I use a silicon carbide, but I've gotten used to that feel. I, 
I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd suggest this. I, it's what I buy, but you have to be careful with it. Use the fine side, don't get too aggressive. Uh, it's good for knocking, but an, an India stone, uh, a Norton brand India stone is what they're really called. Um, otherwise, it's an aluminum oxide stone. It's perfect, a fine stone for all the bench work that we're doing. And they come in like the sticks. This is a half inch stick tool. They have a half inch triangle tool. These are perfect for reaching in there. They're fine enough where you're not gonna damage your fixtures. Um, and they're, they're rough enough where it's actually gonna get the burrs off. So if you've got a fixture and you need to, to, to clean off some pads for something, uh, these fine aluminum oxide stones are perfect. So every shop should have a uh, few boxes of these guys around for super fine work, for, for dressing you know, some, some high speed tools by hand, that type of stuff, for cleaning up you know, some very specific tooling. Uh, for that last little bit, you know, Arkansas stones uh, are amazing. But again, you're not gonna be removing material with these guys. It's just for that final polish. So there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, check it out. Oh, you know, I'll, I'll mention again, there's, uh, I don't know why I was thinking about this. We talked about it before we went on. Silicon carbide, aluminum oxide, you're gonna hear these terms for the rest of your machining lives. So get used to it, especially with like cutoff wheels, grinding wheels, deburr wheels, bench stones. And yeah, they're in, they're in every level of aggressiveness you want to do. Yeah, from cutting off a, a piece of steel tubing to the super fine work yeah. that you're doing there. We were talking about how like the, the, the gun industry, these type of guys, they were actually rolling their, their grips in silicon carbide to give these super aggressive you know, grips that will work even if your hands are, are sweaty and oily. So you're going to see these materials uh, a lot, uh, especially yeah, they're not going anywhere. Yeah. So yeah, it was a great topic. I think that about wraps it up. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us and for coming back to the second stream after we had our uh, little shutdown there. If you missed some part of it, if you logged off and you didn't make it back on, I think what we're gonna do is take these two videos, combine them together and repost them. So check the channel and uh, you can see the, this video in its entirety. And even there on that video, once we post it, uh, comment your questions. We, we look at those comments and can reply or um, the, the, the group of viewers here can reply with different sources where they where they can help each other out. That's it. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much guys.